I fall prey to what all grandparents fall prey to, and that is um, in my excitement to introduce my grandchildren, they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the tr two phenomenal parents they have, Kirsten and Luke. It is good to have your whole family with us today, so thank you for being with us. Would you join me in prayer? And as we come to this sermon today, we come to the end of the sermon series, Then and Now. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. On September 2nd, 1975, the teachers in the North Penn School District in Lansdale, Pennsylvania went on strike. My mother took a sign, headed out the front door for the picket line, and along with her colleagues held their ground. In our conservative community, unions were not okay, and strikes were really not okay. As the teachers took to the streets, so did the parents, and the parents headed out to confront them with shouting and cursing as they walked the picket line. I was beginning my senior year when the teachers struck. In solidarity with my mother and her colleagues, I wanted to march as well. But my mom asked me to not do that, to stay home. And for those of you who've known me a long time, you can understand why she didn't want me there. <laughs> so I stayed home and I supported the families behind the scenes, bringing water to the picketers and to the teachers on the line and other things like food and lunch. One evening, my mom came home shaken by the counter protesters. During the day, one man, a father of one of her students, came up and spit in her face because, in his words, you are not worthy to teach my son. His son, as it turns out, had had all sorts of trouble in school. He had reading problems, and my mother, as an English teacher, took him under her wing. She had given him special attention to help him through the hard times. And the reason the father even knew who my mother was was because he had met with her when she had helped her son, his son. And she stood there in the kitchen as she was preparing dinner and she started to cry. I had not seen my mother cry since the day we received the phone call that her father died of cancer nine years earlier. She was heartbroken that a parent of a child she had fought for and cared for would be so cruel to her for simply standing up for her right to protest. I learned a life lesson that day. People will spit on you and they will lie about you for doing the right thing and standing up for justice. It was a life lesson that would stick with me, one of love and justice, but it was one that I learned through the generations of my family, which is a union family. We are union strong in my family, and I'm proud of my family members who have fought for workers' rights for more than 100 years in America. In the fall of 1984, I helped organize Yale Divinity School students and faculty to stand outside the gates on the picket lines with clerical workers seeking fair wages and benefits. There's something about my senior year, I don't know why it always works this way. In Connecticut, Yale University paid the lowest wages, listen carefully, the lowest wages to clerical workers working anywhere in higher education. This was Yale University. The workers won in the end, but it took four months of a bitter fight with President Bart Giamatti, and yes, for the Cincinnati fans, it's the same one who threw Pete Rose out of baseball. It took us a long time to work through this argument, to work through this strike, a long time. And one of the things that stands out in this strike was that the women, and they were mostly women, crossed their own picket line two weeks before Christmas to go back in and earn one paycheck to pay for their children's Christmas. And when they went back in, the 80% who had walked out 
met their sisters face to face at the water coolers and at the copy machines and said, why aren't you with us? And when they came back out on strike after Christmas, when the students returned to Yale, it was 100% of the clerical workers. I get choked up every time I think about it because looking at their sisters face to face changed everything. That's the way it works. Again, in February 2011, I found myself outside the gates once again, this time outside the Ohio State House, with thousands of police, firefighters, public school teachers, and nurses. Over 360,000 state workers were about to have their rights of collective bargaining stripped away, and I gave myself to the task of organizing pastors, rabbis, and imams around the state to speak on their behalf. The assault on Ohio's public employees came right after the new governor was elected and the legislature swept into office. Swept in by overwhelming numbers, Governor John Kasich and the leadership sought to abolish a 35-year collective bargaining agreement for all unionized state employees. Although 70% of Ohioans, when asked, supported the right to collective bargaining, the assault on public sector employees was brutal, quite frankly. Against this radically exclusive legislation came daily protests on the State House grounds and lawn and the Capitol's atrium and rotunda. You may remember, tens of thousands of people showed up. As a religious leader in Ohio, I worked to, to speak on behalf of the workers themselves and join in the protest. After listening carefully to them and reading the legislation, I knew that the time had come to speak. On March 8, 2011, as the governor gave his State of the State address inside the State House, which, by the way, was the last one John Kasich ever gave in the State House. He went elsewhere to do this afterwards. I was on the uh, west side of the State House addressing over 5,000 people that had gathered. It was serendipitous, but the governor began to speak at the same time I was up to speak. And I, we were outside, he was inside. Our messages were demonstrably different. The governor stood with those who spoke for f policies which were anti-union, and he made no apologies where he stood and for whom he spoke. I was there to challenge that understanding, his understanding of collective bargaining, and to speak up for a different idea, the collective spirit of faith and labor in our state. On that clear, cold March day, this is what I said. What I love about Ohioans is that we work out our problems. We come together and we work together and we face tough times. We find a way through. That is what collective bargaining is all about. It is not about greed, as some people say. It's about fairness and equity. It's about working things out for the good of all people. It means finding what is best for the common good. It means making sacrifices on both sides and finding a way forward. And it works. It has worked for Ohio for a long time. This is not the time to throw out what works in a state, in this case in 2011, where over half a million people are out of work. What has changed, I continued, in the spirit of Ohio? In the tenor of our times, where has moderation and the collective spirit of doing things together gone? How have we reached this point? Mr. Kasich, I ask you to listen to the people of Ohio. Listen and you will hear the voices of men and women who instruct our children, who protect our streets, who put out the fires in our burning buildings. They give their lives to us. They risk their lives for us. They are the symphony of hope. Their in instruments are tuned in service and praise to God and to our community. Listen to them. They are the deacons in our churches. They are the mitzvot in our synagogues. They are our prayer partners in the mosque. There are hundreds of thousands in this symphony of hope. As we hear them cry, we know that the citizens of this fine state also hear them. Students in our high schools, colleges, and universities are clicking on their computer search engines 
and their searches are taking them out of Ohio. Even though their teachers want them to stay, they have begun to lose hope and look elsewhere to find work as future teachers, firefighters, and police. Mr. Kasich, please listen. I know you have faith, but we have faith too. We are out here. We will not go away. We are standing here by the statue of the former governor of Ohio and former president, William McKinley. If you won't listen to us, listen to him. At the base of his statue, it reads, let us ever remember that our interest is in concord, not conflict, and that our real eminence rests in the victories of peace, not those of war. Our earnest prayer is that God will graciously vouchsafe prosperity, happiness, and peace to all our neighbors, and like blessings to all the people and powers of the earth, God will prevail. In the end, the people of Ohio turned out in record numbers that fall to defeat issue two by a vote of 61 to 39 percent. The very next day, conservative leaders met at the State House to begin their next challenge to workers in Ohio called the Right to Work Initiative. And by the way, I had um, thoughts of this last year when issue one passed in the November ballot, and the next day, legislators met to say the people of Ohio are wrong. How dare they say voters are wrong? It's just the vote, right? It is what it is. You don't have to agree with it, but they're not wrong. We're not wrong when we do these things. Labor and economic questions related to them are ever pressing on us in Ohio. The overemployed work long hours in six and seven day work weeks with little to no additional compensation. The underemployed scramble to piece together two and three jobs with no benefits and no perks. And the unemployed are out of work. Some are churning through savings. Others are sinking into debt. But all who are unemployed are struggling to survive. At this point, we are blessed in our state to have an unemployment rate at a 50-year low. But those of us who look at these numbers know they often shield others that aren't counted anymore. This is great news, but the work is still there ahead of us, and we still must stand with those who are struggling. Some would say that the church has no role to play on issues dealing with labor and employers. I could not disagree more. When it comes to the assault on laborers, I feel strongly that I must speak out and that all of us must. I am undaunted in this belief, and I have a good partner. Some of you know his name, Washington Gladden. You knew he was coming up, didn't you? <laughs> he delivered words a hundred years before I did on the same State House steps. They ring true in my heart, and they always will. He said, the labor question is in part an economic question, and all economic questions are fundamentally spiritual questions. In fact, there are no purely spiritual interests since spiritual forces all incarnate themselves in the facts of everyday life and can only be known as they are manifested there. There is indeed danger that the church will make mistakes in dealing with such questions, but the greatest mistake of all is ignoring them. There are no souls that are more in need of saving than the souls getting entangled in the materialisms that undervalue humankind. And there are no people who need more moral guidance, more than those who are grappling with the manifold phases of the labor question. The late German theologian Dorothea Sole, working with themes of Sigmund Freud, offered, authored a little book many years ago called To Love and to Work. Dr. Freud believed that the definition of a sane person is one who is able to find a balance of life and work and love. How simple and how true. Dr. Sole wrote, my book is an attempt to affirm our being created and becoming creators. 
being liberated and becoming agents of liberation, being loved and becoming lovers. She believed that work is not, in essence, God's curse, as some would have us believe in the book of Genesis, but rather as God's intent for human liberation. Freud, Sole, and the Holy Scriptures are right. To work and to love are central to our being human. Now we need to find a way to add grace into the mix every single day so that we can also see that as central to our humanity, to work and to love. I pray that you find balance in your work, love, life. I pray that love will always work for you. Love is the best way to reconcile any broken relationship between anyone. Amen.